when family members ask you what you do for a living, people who don't aren't familiar with video games, what yeah. what do you say you do for a living? That's a funny one because a, lo a lot of people obviously are their interest is a bit peaked when you say you work in video games or whatever, mm -hmm. and of course immediately. You know, it's gotten to be really cliche, but immediately people think, oh, that must be so fun. You just play games all the time. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, you get so used to the question. So, I don't know, you, you kind of find ways to, you know, I, I make games, and then they're used to film. Like, this isn't as common anymore, but a lot of people, they sort of understand film. So, you, you give them the right. analogy to a film role. So, you mm -hmm. know, well, so when I say designer specifically, that's the thing that they get confused about. Is they say, oh, so you program it. Well, yeah. I sometimes do program, but that's not the design role. Yeah. Although, you know, design program overlap. So they say, oh, so you, you know, they get confused. I say, well, it's, sometimes it's like being the director. Sometimes it's like being the screenwriter. Sometimes yeah. it's like being both, you know, um, that sort of thing. But uh, the easiest way is I make the rules for how the game is played. You know, right. someone had to design Monopoly and decide where's Park Place and mm -hmm. why does, you know, Marvin Gardens have less rent than Park Place and all that sort of thing. So then people, you just kind of have to frame it in yeah. something they're used to, like, you know. Okay, but that's interesting because I don't know that every game designer would word it that way, that you mm. design the rules that determine the game, right? Is that a specific kind of game designer? Or in your mind, is that game design? That's a good question. I mean, more and more uh, there are specialty, you know, or different categorizations or kind of specializations of game designer. But I think ultimately, ultimately you're, you're still involved with design, like specifying how the game is played is maybe a more general role. Yeah. But if you were, say, a, a world or narrative designer, mm -hmm. um, you might not think of that in terms of rules, but right. you're still, that's where it's more like the screenwriter. You know, you're, you're actually determining what, what the viewer is going to experience, what the player is going to experience. But, um, I think the roots of computer game design, or really roots of any game design, is um, a game is just kind of an artificial experience for employing some skills in pursuit of a goal, usually. Mm -hmm. So usually there's rules involved there somewhere. Um, right. So I still think it's probably the best general description of, mm -hmm. of what a game designer does. So how long have you been a game designer? How long have you, have oh, you identified yeah. as a game designer? Yeah. Um, I think the the time frame I usually use is around uh, 98 or 99 when I, uh, that's when I started doing something specifically for to try to commercially exploit or whatever, mm -hmm. meaning publish. Yeah. Um, but before that, I had spent many years of kind of tinkering. You know, it really starts at, you know, you're playing D&D &D or something and, yeah. oh, well, you know, it'd be cool if the critical table was different. Yeah. And then, you know, oh, well, what if this monster... It's kind of dumb that that monster does that. What if it did that? Um, so if you go all the way back, you know, probably the first creative game, you know, the first thing I really remember doing anything creative was probably junior high, but I don't really mm -hmm. consider that the point at which I became a game designer. I think the point at right. which I started going, okay, I'm going to take this really seriously and make stuff and put it out there, as opposed to just home, you yeah. know, modding stuff for your own game. So did, did you, did you like go into college? <laughs> To study game design? Uh, no. No. Yeah. Well, I actually know what you went to school yeah. for. What did you go to school for? Um, I went to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo for uh, aerospace engineering because mm -hmm. I was really into planes, wanted to be a pilot, wanted to yeah. work on planes, and and uh, still love planes, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, Good. I'm glad. But, yeah. Uh, me too. But uh, no, there. I was I was doing games though all through college. This is a funny thing. I'm sitting there studying, and I'd play games all the time, and then. Um, Probably the first real like digital game experience, design experience I had, um, well, not counting the war game construction set when I was young, <laughs> but I remember Warlords 2 Deluxe came with a scenario editor um, when I was in university. And this is like okay. maybe 93, yeah. 94. Um, and it was amazing because you could not only set up a scenario, but you could had its own pixel editor for making the unit graphics hmm. and all this stuff. And you know that like that was just a really standout moment. I made this whole War of the Rings scenario, and I like made the wargs and the, you know, like the pixel yeah. art and the whole whole thing, right? And uh, it's just kind of funny when I reflect upon those things now because at the time I was still, I was so into games, but I really didn't see it as career at all. Mm. Like you know, I thought, oh, maybe someday it'd be fun to make something and publish it. That's like a hobby. But, yeah, mm. but you know, and here I am like killing myself getting through the Arrow program, and. Um, now when I reflect back, I think, why didn't I just, you know, go for yeah. that? But 
I think that's because in, in retrospect, you know, now I say, oh, well, I'm, I'm so much more into doing games day to day mm -hmm. than I was maybe as an engineer. But at the time, I have to remember, I was just fanatical about being an engineer. Yeah. I was excited, you know, and the games, the games were a hobby. It was like painting on the side or something. So I would, it's interesting because I would say that um, of all the designers that I'm aware of, uh, you're one of the most engineer-like game designers, right? Would you say that's yeah. true? Uh, define engineer like. Well, in the sense, I mean, compare. Let's let's talk about Hideo Kojima. Okay. Now, to be fair, yeah, I have not, I have not met him. I've yeah. not seen exactly how he works. Yeah. But he seems to me to be a little bit more. Um, Maybe cinematically influenced, or just. Yeah, I don't know how much tinkering he's necessarily doing mm. with numbers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but with in Horde, in Crows, um, and from what I've seen, which is just the trailer, yep. Darkest Dungeon. Um, Darkest Dungeon? or Darkest Dungeon. It's a single dungeon. It's Well, the title is singular. Okay, um, got it. But you, nice. you go to other dungeons along the way and, and okay. ultimately end up in the darkest, the darkest dungeon. Of many dark dungeons. Yeah. Okay, like I like just that. Just when you think it's bad, you go to the darkest dungeon. The darkest which one. Which is even worse than okay. you can imagine. But like... Like just playing yeah. these games, playing two of these three games that <laughs> I've just said. Yeah. Um, the, like it's very clear because I mean Horde certainly is board game like, right? Yeah, influenced for sure. Yeah. Which is funny because it's such an action game, but underneath, yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. You know, I think certainly when I deconstruct the mechanics, yeah, yeah, I think probably what you're getting at is, I mean, I'm really into core mechanics. That's what mm -hmm. it comes to, and I love numbers and I love tinkering, you know, with that kind of stuff. And the systems relationships are what really, I think, yeah. they're not the only thing that excite me, but like they're definitely the thing I'm best at in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, there's many skills of being a designer these days. And certainly the systems and core mechanics are not only what excite me, but like if I had to honestly rate myself and what I'm good at <laughs> and what I'm bad at, I, like those, those are, you know, yeah. those are things I'm decent at. Um, and yeah, I think part of that, comes from, it certainly comes from the technical background, but I've always had a really weird split of left mm -hmm. brain, right brain, because um, it's funny for me, because when, it, when I came to games, everyone thought, wow, you know, you're just, because I've been working in corporate America for like eight years, you know, like hardcore manufacturing, yeah. big industry, aerospace, yeah, yeah. and, uh, you know, everyone thought, oh, this guy's, you know, so... So sort of normal, but then but back in Corbin Mary, they were like, yeah. "He's so weird. He's doing games on the side, and he's yeah. you know writing scripts, and you know they they thought I was just this weird artistic type, and yeah. now I'm, I'm in games. It's like, well, they think I'm this, yeah. Know, really. So, um, but I, I like it. You know, it, it certainly um, reflects my personality, which is mm. a mix of those things. But but yeah, I love you know I love board game design, and board game design, you know, the narrative is through the gameplay mechanics. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to think of maybe a few a few things that maybe don't fit that category. Like if you're playing Once Upon a Time, the card game where it's kind of a yeah. interactive storytelling. But I mean, it's hard or to like, say. Yeah, like it, Train of Thought or whatever that one is. Yeah. yeah, or maybe even elements of, say, Dixit or something. But but really, most board games, and certainly mm -hmm. a lot of the games that mechanical. I enjoy. Yeah, they're mechanical. Mm -hmm. And game-wise, that's why I think mechanical. And my period of, my the really influential period of game playing for me was when I was, you know, junior high playing Commodore 64. Yeah. And of course, going back to, you know all the early systems too, but yeah, a lot of times those you know those games they they might be action, they might be strategy, but they're all mechanic focused. So um, I don't know. I just yeah, I'm a pig and slop when I'm in the midst of mechanics. Yeah, um, you know the sort of the more purely say uh, creative is not the right word because I that that feels like that you know says there's no creativity in the yeah. mechanics, which is BS. But um, the well, hardcore say like blank slate artistic. Hey, you know we're gonna make yeah. the geography look like this and level design. Like I had a, par a partner that was at some of the companies with me. He was great at, at say, the level layout. Yeah. And level layout isn't something I'm really good at. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can do it competently, I guess, but right. it's, it feels like pain. Um, whereas it's, mechanics are, are a friendly pain to yeah. me. Yeah. yeah, they come a little yeah. more naturally. Um, so, okay. What this is all leading towards, yeah. right, is now Darkest Dungeon is on the horizon. Yes. Everyone's psyched for it. Looks I very hope interesting. Some people are psyched. Yeah, some yeah. people are psyched, and we're psyched, and yeah. I think more people will be psyched as they they learn about it. Uh, so, what is Darkest 
Dungeon exactly? Darkest Dungeon is a strategy RPG, computer RPG, mm. um, that kind of deconstructs the, the premise that you know, all RPGs are found in all these characters, and they get together, and you fight endless monsters, and they mm -hmm. fight to their last hit point, the characters, and, you know, you get new loot, and you upgrade your sword, yeah. and then you fight a bigger monster, and then ultimately you, you know, find the seven parts of the rod of whatever, yeah. and you defeat the um, enemy. <laughs> but lost in that whole thing is, is this idea of um, what's it like for the heroes? Yeah. So what we wanted to do is create a game where the... Uh, you know, it's a total, it's one of the oldest computer ge uh, game genres, you know, like when you go back to the early Rogue predecessors and things like mm -hmm. this. And, um, but what about this idea that, you know, where, where's the hero's part in this? So what Darkest Dungeon is, is it's kind of a strategy management exploration into um, the psychological toll on the heroes of being 500 feet underground, fighting undead, running out of food, the lights yeah. fading, you know, maybe they'll never make it back alive. Um, we thought that's an interesting premise. So, what we thought is, what if we, what if we take that premise and then, you know, blow it out to game where, not only are you worried about, oh shoot, you know, I need to kill this giant ghoul or whatever, but mm -hmm. you're worried about, wow, when this giant ghoul throws a bloody skull at me, yeah, this may freak the shit out of my, you know, <laughs> my weakest character. They may go to pieces and right. stop fighting, and now the other three characters have to carry the load, and then, you know, what does that mean? You know, do they? Mm -hmm. How do you manage that situation? And so it was kind of something fun we, we talk about. We look at movies, we look at books. You know, like I, I think, you know, on, on our website we mentioned this, but you know, look at something like the scene out of Aliens where they're dropping down on the planet yeah. and Hudson's just bragging about how, you know, they, sharp sticks and nuclear yeah. weapons, you know, they're going to just obliterate the aliens, right? There's, yeah. They're trained Marines, there's nothing to be worried about. And then the, the whole bit of, well, you know, how many drops have you had? 700? You know, how many yeah. real drops? Zero or something like that. Yeah, you know, I forget the exact verbs, but yeah. or verbiage. But then later on in the movie, that pays off where now Hudson's in the thick of the shit and he just goes to pieces. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. He, like people are dying. He doesn't hold together. Now, uh, um, Band of Brothers. I love that that miniseries, like the the uh, Band of Brothers Europe. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was amazing. War games have done this for a long time. They've modeled morale. They've modeled mm -hmm. this concept that it's not just your firepower of what you can bring. It's you know the, all these yeah. other I don't think even intangibles is a word, but you can win a battle yeah, your on metal. morale. Mm -hmm. The other, the other, the other army could be better equipped, better led, yeah. um, all these things. But if you guys yeah. hold through, so yeah. you know, obviously, or if you kill the right, you know, unit yeah. or whatever, yeah. everyone else is like, well, kill the great. leader. You know, there's old, uh, there's old, you know, proverbs about you know, chop off the head and the body will die yeah, and all yeah. this stuff. Um, anyway, we were having fun talking about all that stuff in the context of. An RPG, mm -hmm. and once we realized, okay, this is fun to talk about. What if, what if your holy man was like, you know, questioning God? What if your, um, what if your best fighter um, yeah. was afraid? You mm -hmm. know, what if all these things, right? You yeah, know, yeah. and so you start coming up with all these little um, anecdotes yeah. of of stories through because, you know, people love stories. Yeah, and then we realized there was game mechanics there. You know, not just yeah. getting a chance to experience, but how could this be interesting? Because ultimately, um, like, fun is a hard thing to define, but w we want it to be, you know, it's not just bad things happening to you, it's fun. So you have to lead, you know, the short yeah. version here, finally I'm getting to it, is, is you have to lead a party of adventurers through their dungeon crawling, mm -hmm. um, and you have to keep them together, and you have to keep them alive, and you have to keep them fighting and make it to the end with dealing all these psychological and emotional and, yeah. you know, things in addition to... Kind of the normal stuff, the normal that's, stuff. that's in, in an RPG. Yeah. So you've talked before um, in your fantastic article on the Pentecade Report, mm -hmm. may it rest in peace, yeah. um, about how you really seek out the concept before coming up with mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. That you don't necessarily start with... Um, like, oh, like, what if you had, you know, two different health bars, like, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you, I'm not sure how to phrase the question. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Like, how you actually, how do you identify a concept that has the kind of, what you're looking for yeah. as a designer? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a personal sort of, I think every, everyone, um, any creative, any type, whether you're talking a painter or a game designer, uh, has their own creative method. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one thing that, maybe 
experience has been fun for is you start realizing your creative method. I think at the beginning you're trying to emulate people or, or you're just thinking, I must, you know, yeah. like if you if you looked up to Hideo Kojima, you're like, I must think like Hideo Kojima. Yeah. Uh, no, you don't. Um, or, you know, you have to think the way you think. So the way mm-hmm. I think is, and the whole reason I design games is actually is a result of having played games and enjoyed games my whole life. And I th- that's probably true for anyone who gets into a field. You know, if you... Well, if you love movies, you you want to work on them. If you, mm-hmm. but so for me, it's that feeling of wonderment and excitement of playing a game, and being enthused with the theme and the mechanic. Like that's the perfect game is when the theme and the mechanic yeah. come together and they're both great. So for what gets me excited to design is um, being excited about the theme. And so despite the fact that I love mechanics and on, and and want to create interesting new mechanics that are really rock solid things, uh, I need I need to kind of be excited before. Uh, mm-hmm. Before I get into that, so it always starts with just being inspired by an idea, a theme. Yeah. Um, like I really want to do a mining game. I've been like reading up on all this gold mining of you know yeah. the gold rush and all. And, um, and there's all, all these neat things about it, for example. And then you start, I think, I start seeing the mechanics in it. Yeah. You know, and that's where things start getting really interesting. And so um, organically, I think in the article I talked about this, if you have a great theme, then to me the mechanics start falling out of it naturally. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, with, with Horde, uh, I think it was a cool theme and that, you know, I, Horde started theme-wise, not mechanically. It was, oh, wouldn't it yeah. be cool if you were the dragon? Like, how does Smog feel about all this? Like, yeah. you know, we always see it from the other end, like, Smog has this huge pile of treasure. Mm-hmm. Why? Well, because he likes it. Why? You know, yeah. so I start thinking, oh, well, why does a dragon like treasure? And what does a dragon have to put up with day-to-day life? You yeah. know, well, he's got to, you know... He's probably judged on the value of his bank account, right? <laughs> and he, uh, you know, yeah. he's got to worry about other dragons getting in his business. And, um, you know, he's got to keep the humans in check because if they start not fearing him, then they mm-hmm. may take over or come take his wealth. So mm-hmm. there's like, you know, there's the whole idea of you got to keep them in fear. You don't necessarily have to kill them all. Because yeah. if you kill them all, there's no treasure for them to make and take. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So now you start getting into mechanics. So, like, you know, in Horde, one of the mechanics I still think is one of the coolest things that. Um, of, you know, is is very like you don't see it until you played it a few times. The tribute mechanic of mm-hmm. you scare the town, but don't kill it, and then once they become afraid of you, they kind of erect your symbol above the town, and yeah. you know they're in awe of the red dragon, and yeah. then they send these carts of gold to your to yeah. your horde. So, for example, I think that's kind of a cool mechanic because when you're playing multiplayer, for example, it's passive income. Is basically yeah. you can go kill a town, take the gold, take it back. But if you can scare the town, then they're sending this stuff. It's mm-hmm. income you don't have to work for anymore. You did the work, you're reaping the rewards. Mm-hmm. It's like interest payments, right? Yeah. Um, and so you're off fighting the enemy, meaning the other dragons or other players on this town. But this town is like, this, is, yeah. your horde is growing. It's like, yeah, yeah. you know, my grandfather, I said, like, get a passive income business. <laughs> and um, yeah. But that came directly out of theme. Right. You know, I didn't, I didn't sit there and go, well, you know, there has to be more ways to gather gold or something like that. And that would be a viable mm-hmm. way of thinking, but I just find for me, you know, so Crow's the same way. Um, Darkest Dungeon, it's working the same way. You know, we talk about, well, what are they, why would the characters do this? Or it's really human nature is the irony mm-hmm. with Darkest Dungeon. You don't talk about, we hardly, it's not specifically role-playing games. You just talk about, well, remember that time on the team when we were going to the deadline and this guy freaked out? It's like, well, yeah. that, that's the same sort of stuff that, that happens. So. Yeah. So I just find um, when you have a great theme, the or- organically mechanics will shake out. It takes a lot of work to craft those mechanics and maybe pick the right one and, and, and tune it and things like that. But uh, when, when you've got solid inspiration, then the heavy lifting is a lot lighter, um, if that yeah, makes any sense. Absolutely. How far into like development of a concept does it take to realize that it might not have mm. the... the uh, it might not be as deep as you thought it would be. Yeah. You have to really um, get past the, oh my God, wouldn't it be fun to make a game about blank? Yeah. And that, that phase lasts you like a couple hours of brainstorming. Like, like I mean, a couple hours of work. Like, so let's mm-hmm. say you had an idea. Wouldn't it be cool if we made a game about whatever? Right. And then you start like kind of listing some stuff out and talking about it. Um, if it's flash in the pan, you can kind of tell because you start kind of struggling for where to take it, yeah. or what mechanics might be in there, or what the rest of the game would be. Mm-hmm. Um, and But there's really no way to tell in, until you kind of dive in. And then if you if you sort of run into walls right away, it either means you're not ready f- kind of mentally for the challenge, or or the, it just may not be a good idea. Mm-hmm. Um, 
this would happen a lot like when we'd be sitting around trying to think of things to pitch and um, you know regardless who came up with the idea sometimes you say something and it sounds really cool and then you just kind of see oh there's nowhere to go with that like everything yeah. is surface level um, and so this, I think to some degree experience helps with that where you can start seeing like you can think quickly like where could that go mm -hmm. but it also takes time like you need you need to brainstorm and, and make sure that you've kind of uh, like you might see a dead end, but someone else may bring up something that basically removes that yeah. obstacle. But um, I've had that, yeah, it happens all the time. You kind of get enthused about an idea, then you start kind of getting into it. And so there's no really way to know ahead of a time other than, you know, if, if it is shallow, you'll find out pretty quick usually mm. um, because you're just going to run out of. So Darkest Dungeon is a great example because... Um, uh, my partner Chris, Chris and I. So Chris, it was actually Chris's idea. Um, we used, we'd get together and talk about game ideas. We were all both at different studios and things. And uh, so he he kind of came up with this. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if you know we put the yeah. the dungeon back into this thing, right? And uh, we we talked about it over a couple of years actually. So every month or two we'd get together and shoot, you know talk about things and we'd start talking Darkest Dungeon and the ideas would just flow. It was just like nonstop, like you couldn't, you couldn't capture all the ideas. And uh, that happened repeatedly. So that's one of the reasons we're doing it is, you know, there was many other ideas we talked about, some of which we either just didn't talk about again. So you got to think, okay, there's yeah. something not ready or not right for that. Way. But this one we want to talk about all the time, and then we'd get brainstorming and write stuff down. I've got, you know, over the course of the last few years, I have many, like, most good notebooks of just, yeah. I keep notebooks as I'm doing things. And it's like, oh, there's a page on Darkest Dungeon. Oh, there's a page. And then later, there's a page yeah. in a new notebook. And so there's, like, probably four notebooks that have pages of Darkest Dungeon. Yeah. Um, so that was a big reason for me, for example, why I want to work on it is our problem is just choosing what to put in, you know. Yeah, that, so that's my next question is how do you balance the especially as a designer, mm -hmm. the, this creative brainstorming, all these ideas with the realities of <laughs> scope, right? Yeah. And budget and whatever. The, the realities of just mm -hmm. what's feasible for Darkest Dungeon 1. It's, it's a process that is a mix of um, experience, discipline, and uh, experimentation, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so experience-wise, I've done enough projects to kind of know how they go. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I haven't set a ship date for this exact thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it wouldn't surprise me if it slipped, but um, the point is you start yeah. getting a feel for, okay, how big a game is this? Um, secondly is the um, discipline is knowing what to concentrate your time on, mm -hmm. because, and also the resources, not just your time. So, um, for example, it would be a bad idea to just spend tons of time up front on a system that maybe could be cut out or it really isn't the key system in the game. Yeah. Um, because if you find yourself in a situation where, oops, we need to hasten this along to a conclusion, mm -hmm. you can't change what you did before. You can only change what you do forward. So you kind of have to prioritize. And then experimentation is games, I think, more than any other, maybe not any other medium, but certainly... I'm trying to think of something else that is like yeah. games with the amount of uncertainty like between the idea phase and the completion phase. Yeah. And this is why so many game companies, there, there's many reasons why, but one of the reasons why many game companies have trouble scoping and shipping and getting games done on time is you don't there's know. just this huge amount of, well, we think that'll work, let's try it, yeah. and oops, that wasn't fun, let's you know retool it. Um, and so with Darkest Dungeon, for example, one thing we're making sure we do is we need to experiment. That's a vital part of making a good game, I think, is mm -hmm. experimenting and being willing to say, that didn't really work. Maybe we'll cut that out. Um, yeah. This seems to be really going well. Let's let's increase that its role in the mm -hmm. game. Um, so it's all those things together. Um, but there's no, it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing to know mm -hmm. just how big of a game to do. And that's why, you know, you get in these, people thought it would take a year and it takes six or something. You know, those yeah. stories are all over the place. Uh, we can't afford to do that in terms of, you know, the, just the way we're structuring things, we're not really, we won't let it stretch out to a five-year game. Like we, yeah. as much as we want to make it as great as it possibly can be, um, you know, there's a lot of other factors at play. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we, we would rather make an awesome sort of tight core game and then if that does well, we've got expansion ideas till the cows come home, you know. Yeah, is, I maybe don't want to talk about this, is, is Darkest Dungeon isometric? Uh, no, it's side on. I can talk oh, really? about that. Yeah. So if you've uh, seen the trailer, or anyone who hasn't yeah, seen yeah. the trailer, go see the trailer. 
Yeah. Uh, it's there's different elements to it, but one of the views you see is actually a side-on. It's kind of side-scrolling through the dungeon, seeing your, your characters. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the actual uh, map navigation is kind of roguelike, where you, you're seeing top-down, and you're actually... Right. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, journeying through. So, so you're kind of going through a bit roguelike. Meanwhile, you're seeing the character from the side. So when you see the trailer um, and they're fighting, that's mm -hmm. actually pretty representative of, I mean, that's our visual target for the game. Hmm. Um, what we didn't show in the initial trailer is HUD and all these things. Yeah. Um, and, but we're, we're uh, when we kickstart, our current plan is to kickstart in February. Sure. Um, 2014, so that may yep. have already happened by the time. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, we're going to be showing a lot more on the gameplay, but certainly our goal of the first trailer was, this is, this is the hook, this is, this is why you should care about the game. But a lot of people just assume that the combat um, that's going on yeah. there is just completely... Yeah, is not representative. Yeah, it's not of, representative. Yeah. And in fact, it's quite representative of our, of our idea. And so, mm -hmm. including the camera moves and stuff, so we've already got a lot of that working. It's pretty cool. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a neat mix of sort of rogue, roguelike with, with side-on, things like that. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, the reason I ask is because just on the surface, not necessarily in terms of content, mm -hmm. but the team that I know is working on Darkest Dungeon and the what seems to be the scope of the project yeah. reminds me a lot of Bastion and okay. yep. super giant, yeah. you know, these people with a lot of industry experience. Mm -hmm. It strikes me as, as being... Um, yeah. perhaps somewhat superficially similar in the sense that it's like, oh, well, you know, this is, we're not, you guys aren't mm -hmm. making um, watchdogs. Yeah. Um, That's probably the thing I should have said in that other bit about, you know, how do you figure out how much game. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest things you can do is just choose, you know, you get to define the playing field you're mm -hmm. playing in. So um, Bastion, for example, did a great, yeah, I mean, amazing game. Mm -hmm. um, and they leverage, I mean, their productivity is quite high. Their efficiency of resources, not to get too technical about it, yeah. but from you what can. I understand, yeah. um, you know, one artist did the majority of the work in that mm -hmm. game. Um, that's, you know, that's at least yeah. the word on Certainly the street. Certainly it seems that way. Yeah, and so we're doing a similar thing. So, for example, the reason the game is, well, not the reason, one of the reasons the game is side on and drawn and with this amazing art style mm -hmm. that Chris Brassa does, uh, which is, you know, super cool and, and um, you know, one of the reasons I part partnered with him, of course, huge reason yeah. is he's just really talented, is um, A, because that's great for the theme and, the, and you know, the style. Yeah. B, it's achievable with our team. Uh, I mean, could we make Darkest Dungeon with 3D models? And yes, we could, yeah. you know, but, and, and we could make it look good, but the resources, I mean, the, just the scope of the game becomes huge now. Mm -hmm. Whereas right now, you know, Chris is going to produce, you know, most of the assets in the game. Yeah. And, um, you know, we'll use some other contractors and things for effects and, sure. and things like that. But, so, so you really do, I think it's smart to look at your team. and. Um, you know, if we look at, say, my involvement on it, I mean, one of the reasons Chris partnered with me is he knew that I can dive yeah. into these systems and um, yeah. and make get a them lot done. gel. Yeah, and right. and they're you know it's a fit for my skill set. So it would be crazy not to make sure that the team you have their skill set mm -hmm. applies. So um, and I think about this stuff economically all the time. Not that I'm all you know, but I'm I have to put the business hat on sometimes. Mm -hmm. Is I don't think there's a lot of correlation at least on the in-game side of, you know, people don't care whether you're doing 3D or 2D. They, they don't care whether you're doing pixel or non-pixel. I mean, they mm -hmm. care based on their personal preferences, but the point is that doesn't determine how many copies you can sell. Yeah, you know? no. I mean, Minecraft know. is a great example, mm -hmm. right? Um, people just want a cool game. And so can we deliver them a cool game with amazing stylized art and a really cool game mechanics in doing it this way with a small team? Yes. And could we take 15 people and make it 3D and, and also be a cool game, yes. Is that going to increase our sales by yeah. a factor of three? Like, I don't think it would. No. Um, you know, so it's not, it's not sort of, you can't assume that, you know, the more money you put into it. gimmicks you put it, yeah, the more money mm -hmm. you put into it, then it's gonna pay off. I think the biggest thing is just having a cool game. So, um, but aside from all that, the 2D look is great. It's made us stand out, um, mm -hmm. you know, people, they'll, they'll remember it more, you know, they'll remember Chris's visual style, yeah. whereas if we were sort of doing low poly modeling or something, it, it you know a lot of other people are doing that. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, tr I'm not but trying you, to criticize. You want to that. distinguish you yourself. Niche. Yeah, right? you need to distinguish. Yeah. It's the marketplace is all about mm -hmm. standing out now. I mean, making a good game is is sort of the pro the barrier to entry, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of good games out there. So now you need to find a way to be 
to distinguish yourself, yeah. yeah, and have people remember. So we want people to remember, of course, why Darkest Dungeon is cool in terms of, whoa, the psychological trauma of the heroes. We want them to remember the art style. We want them, you know, one of the things we're getting lots of good feedback on is the, you know, someone, um, we're doing a Q&A with someone else, and they said, hey, well, you know, the types of characters you have, the Plague Doctor and things like that, they're, they're really unusual kind of mm -hmm. for... And so that's something we're making sure to play up because, yeah, like p we want people to almost see a character and say, well, that's a Darkest Dungeon type character. Right. You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the Plague Doctor or the, oh, there's a few I want to talk about, but I'm not allowed to. You can't. But, but the, you know, we'll, we'll announce a few more um, soon. And, I, and it would be, it's a total marketing win for us if people go, oh, yeah, that makes sense that that's the game that that's from. Right. It's just weird. It's not a fighter, you know, like mm -hmm. even the Crusader. And sure, other places have done Crusader, but. What's the other side of his personality? Well, maybe, you know, Crusader is a term, for example, not to get too off topic, but this goes to the creative direction things. Everything is on topic. It, it's, it's something that we're thinking about a lot right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of talking about, sure. you know, yeah, stuff yeah. we talked about this week is, um, for example, Crusader. You know, a lot of people see that and they think, oh, you know, valiant, valiant, like, fighting to the, you know, whatever yeah, yeah. you use to fight. Well, half the world goes, <laughs> this is that's pretty evil shit, right? Mm -hmm. You know, come mm -hmm. in, take our yeah. land, you know, in the name take of our, God or whatever. Spices. And and my point is not a religious debate, but it's darkest dungeon. There's there's kind of all the you know, there's no true good yeah. and there's no true evil. It's all you know. Yeah. Well, the true evil you're fighting. I guess that's sure. That's um. So if, imagine a crusader who's just consumed with fervor and zealot, you know, yeah. zealotry about what he's doing. So like like if we can pay that off in the game where. Yeah, he's great at fighting these monsters, but if he's not like fighting for the good of like he goes to pieces, or maybe mm -hmm. like he can't see who's the enemy anymore, and these kinds of yeah. things. But um, anyway, yeah, it just all goes to sort of finding a way for your game to stand out. So, how, uh, how much of D Darkest Dungeon is is a like tailored experience mm -hmm. versus being procedural or um, yeah. you know repeatable or whatever? Yeah, great question. Um, a lot of it's it's more sandbox. Mm. It's more procedural. Okay. Um, we want those moments to happen. We don't want to script them. And we believe, and our goal and our challenge, I guess, is to build the systems in such a way that they will happen. Mm -hmm. And that, because we, we don't want, <clears throat> when you go to the water cooler, <laughs> whatever, yeah, yeah. whether your water cooler is Twitter or, yeah. in you know. Your in your home. Yeah. In your room. Talking to your buddies. Um, we don't want you to say, hey, did you get to that part where, yeah. you know, like The Last of Us or something. Yeah, um, and I love The Last of Us, good game, but that's not the game we're More making. More like Mass Effect, yeah. or something where people are or like, Fallout. like or Fallout. I love talking exactly. Fallout yeah. or um, Skyrim. Yeah, yeah, those stories are really fun. Even GTA. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, and it's not also practical for us to, I think, script everything. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so yes, no, it's more sandbox and kind of systems built. We want you to have these crazy stories that you share with everybody where you'll, you know, you'll say, oh, well, I was down there with, you know, I had, I had a crusader and, you know, a vestal and this and whatever. And then we got into this and this guy's afraid of skeletons and sure enough, skeletons. So he freaks out, you know, he yeah, pops yeah. to depression. Um, we camp, you know, we, we start trying to encourage him to it'll be better, it'll be better. He, he kind of <laughs> shouts, he stresses the other guy out. Now he pops. You know, he turns abusive. Yeah. Now he starts, you know, just telling every, giving everybody tough love. These things, I think, can happen with the Simpsons we're building, but yeah. they're not going to be scripted, no. Have you played the game, uh, I think it's called Gods Will Be Watching? I've seen it. No, I haven't seen played it. it. Yeah. All right, well, then never mind. Yeah, better. Um, but, uh, yeah, never mind. Um, I can't speak intelligently on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we think about young aspiring game designers. Mm -hmm. um, there's kind of, there's a few common mistakes, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, which is interesting on your kind of theme idea, one of them seems to be that um, a lot of, of people maybe play, games take up too large a percentage of their life experience. Mm. Um, do you think that that is, you mean they're getting that feedback from people in their lives? Like No, not that's actually not at all what I mean. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I see what you're what saying. What I mean is yeah. is that their game ideas, like when you're talking about a concept, mm -hmm. each of these concepts, you're talking about crows, you're talking about dragons, talking about um, kind of morale mm -hmm. uh, in a dungeon dungeoneering environment. Um, 
these are concepts that are not related to games, really. Mm -hmm. They're kind of just separate concepts yeah, entirely. Yeah. It isn't like, it's like, hey, like, I really like Tetris. Yeah. And I really like Zelda. Yeah. So my game is Tetris meets Zelda. Yeah. Right? Yeah. With a little bit of Sly Cooper, because I like that. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, th how does that work, right? Like, how do you avoid that? How do you, um, I have a better way to do this. How do you? I think I see what you're driving at, but yeah. Cool. Well, because it's like, it, it's, it's, it's it, You know what, there's uh, different ways of creating. So, you know, we talked a bit about sort yeah. of the way I'm inspired. Well, other people are inspired completely differently and it, and it works for them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you could say, oh, well, I really like the top-down, you for, know, yeah. adventuring in, in original Zelda and that's so cool and what if, we brought in an achievement system, whatever you're, mm -hmm. you're saying. And that, that's certainly a, a great way to arrive at a game, potentially. Um, if what you're kind of saying is, but there, for me, I've always, I'm inspired by a really broad category of things. And I think maybe anytime you're too insular to one area, maybe it, it uh, you lose your peripheral vision of other things. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if your job is to be a hardcore specialist of this genre and this type of game, like right. you better live and breathe, you know. I've seen job postings before where I'd be like, oh, that'd be kind of interesting to be at that company. But then I realize I don't live and breathe that product. Mm -hmm. I'd love to go in there and add some creative ideas to do it, and I think I right. could. But I don't spend all my time, for example, playing Dota and League of Legends, and that's it, you know, or whatever. Right. Like, that's it. That's all I play. I know it backwards and forwards. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm a sampler. I like the buffet. Yeah. I like, you know, having a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and, and things like that. And um, so I think it comes down to creative process, the way you're, way you're inspired. And I think it's cool to be inspired by a mechanic, you know. Um, at some point, I know thinking about Geometry Wars mm -hmm. led to things in Horde, you know. But right. you could say the same thing about Robotron. I mean, it's a dual stick. Sure. Um, but, and then you start saying, well, that's a really cool moment in that game where that happens. So I don't want to give the impression that I don't, draw on other games, I totally do. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if you're kind of just, like you're saying young designers might make mistakes from being too buried in that, but I mean, all that is an experience thing too. You know, you, not that you necessarily get universally better with experience, but mm. doing anything multiple times generally gives you more, you know, yeah. more knowledge. Well, it's hard ability. to get, yeah, there's a good quote about this. It's, it's yeah. hard to get worse at something that you do every day. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess I'm just curious about how you process or like osmotize mm -hmm. the world around you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, are you someone who's constantly like, you know, you're doing the dishes yeah. and you're trying to think of a hook yeah. or is it always a surprise? Uh, no, I, no, there's a lot of hard work, yeah. Um, there's a lot of thinking. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that, you know, goes out the other or or just never amounts to anything. Um, there are the brilliant flashes of inspiration. Well, brilliant, I'm not trying to, but yeah. you know the, brilliant, wow, boom. amazing, maybe the yeah. best ever. Yeah, yeah, uh, or something will happen and it solved itself. Mm -hmm. um, I love reading about, uh, I don't know, it's like when you read about writing. Um, mm. One of my favorite authors is Robert E. Howard and he invented Conan and he was a pulp mm -hmm. writer back in the yeah, 30s. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, not really high regarded at the time. He was a very successful pulp writer, but he was a pulp writer. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but when he talks about Conan, though, he says he, he basically leapt from the page, or leapt from his head onto the page. Like, yeah. a lot of his other things, he had to kind of crank the stories out, figure it out. But Conan almost just wrote himself, is basically the way he explained it. And I think <laughs> that's, that's true with, with you know, with, with uh, creation. There's certain games yeah. that almost write themselves. And then some writers, um, they're, you know, tying back to your question, some writers will... You know, they say, well, I listen to dialogue everywhere. You know, I'll be at the coffee shop yeah. and I'll overhear how this person's saying. And then, you know, like the great dialogue writers, some of them, they're drawing. So, yes, I draw, I mean, I, I draw from everything. I think about everything. I mean, there was kind of a period where I couldn't stop it. It's just anything I got enthused about, I'd immediately start thinking of what game I could make and what mechanics would fit it. And mm -hmm. um, it doesn't happen all the same way, uh, all the same time anymore. I give myself some brain downtime. <laughs> but... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I just, I don't know, I'm interested in mechanics, so, you know, economics, too, is really interesting to me, and I find game mechanics and economics are, are basically the same yeah. thing, and, <laughs> uh, you know, economics is all driven by 
this time value of money and the idea that you know if I have this money to use it, mm -hmm. it has a value and a usage value and so if I borrow money from you you know you lost the usage of the money and there must be some benefit in you so yeah. there's interest and games are the same way you you need to provide a reason for a player to do an action um, this this is one of, by the way like I think the simplest things you can do as a game designer it doesn't um, to make a good game is there should always be a reason why the action that you're presenting as an option to the player should mm -hmm. be done and where a lot right. of games fall flat is there's times when you would never do that yeah you're like yeah. why would I ever do that mm -hmm. why would I ever do the you know the the low or, or this attack is. when this attack doesn't cost you more and does twice as much damage. Mm -hmm. You know, and that it's those things still happen. There's still what okay. I would consider design errors. Um, you know, the, sometimes it's a complex situation where someone will say, "Well, this character's OP," and that's much bigger. Like it's easy to say something's OP just because you're yeah. in that mood. But um, but the point is, like, there should always be a reason why a, a game action is possible or why. Yeah. And that reason might be, you know value in terms of what it can do towards the goal. It might be narrative value, it might be fun value, mm -hmm. but as long as you make reasons for all these things, then you know that's, that's like the, the tight core of a game. Yeah. Um, so that's very interesting because one of my favorite games ever, maybe my favorite game ever is Magic the Gathering, mm -hmm. right? And um, Wizards um, of the coast, yeah. not wizards yeah, yeah. in general. <laughs> they don't like the game at all. Um, wizards has spoken in, in the past, or designers there, mm -hmm. about how because people always complain there's cards that we would never use, mm -hmm. right? Here's these are cards. These cards are useless, mm -hmm. right? But they're saying, well, this is the problem, right? There are three gaming profiles, three player mm -hmm. profiles that, that we use when we're, when we're designing a, a set yeah. of magic cards, right? And I forget what their names are exactly, but there's the one that's like the kind of tinkerer, mm -hmm. wants to find the diamond in the rough, whatever. Yeah. And for that player who wants to look through all the cards that everyone has written off mm -hmm. and find the one actually, like, mm -hmm. eh, if you do it this way, like this card is actually viable, there have to also be cards that are that, that, actually bad, Yeah. right? If every single card only seemed to be bad but was actually useful, yeah. then every, nobody would ever write off cards. Yeah, and then there's, you could argue there's less, basically there's less skill because you know everything's useful, so mm -hmm. you, you can't accidentally make yeah. a terrible deck. So um, is that something that you actually have to deal with in games like, like Darkest Dungeon in particular, which I yeah. assume, I might be wrong, I assume it'll have like, uh, choices about equipment mm -hmm. um, and what spells you want to get or whatever, right? Abilities, yeah, and characters as, mm -hmm. you know, characters and abilities and which abilities you train up, yeah. yeah. Like, is, is, there, is there ever actually a benefit? This might be mm. an unanswerable question. Is there ever a benefit to maintaining some of the useless yeah. options? Yes, because, uh, well, it, when you really boil down to useless, I guess, um, let's say something truly was, you know, inferior mm -hmm. in every way you right know. Um, ignoring for a moment the narrative benefits or whatever yeah um, or it the still might be interesting because it. there's some players who want to say hey I made a party of the you know I'm trying to think this has happened in a few games before where there was something that was just truly bad yeah and now there's this whole competition of see how good you can be with the bad thing like uh, there's um, that like tofu boy Character oh, in yeah. Super Meat Boy, right? Yeah, yeah. The like, what are the vegan meat boy? That's just like impossible. He's worse than everything, or something. Yeah, like he's literally. It's yeah. the game is almost unplayable. Um, and that's almost you know a commentary and humor value. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we certainly aren't going out of our way to design anything that's inferior with no no side benefit at all. But we are doing some kind of cool stuff where that's not to say everything's balanced. There mm. are some we're going to put some characters in the game, for example that are um, clearly worse at many things than other characters. But right. they might be really good at one thing. Right, or, that's, that is Or, valuable. for example, um, without going into it more because we've announced it, but sure. um, there's some characters, for example, that might be just absolutely terrible in combat and in the dungeon in general, but have some really strong town benefits. Uh, right. Well, that's so interesting. Now, so yeah. now we've created this really interesting thing where... Okay, let's say you're kind of good at the game, or you've done a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, now carry some dead weight down in your party and see how you do. And now yeah. that's a new challenge, and it's an interesting challenge because 
um, I mean, yes, it's a way of kind of ratcheting the difficulty, but it's also a, it's not just about difficulty, it's kind of people want to achieve things. Mm -hmm. And they want to do interesting things, the, the experimenters, the tinkerers. Yeah. Um, so a, a, a min-maxer isn't going to be interested, perhaps. Mm. Um, but someone, not everybody plays like a min-maxer. No. Um, and you kind of have to accommodate, well, ideally, the more player types you accommodate, then the more people you can reach, yeah. um, which I've, I've always thought this is a, you know, that's an interesting thing to consider, is you can't, you can get really insular thinking about like, everybody plays it like this. For example, um, I think they did that when they went from Diablo 2 to Diablo 3, is there was a bit of, well, we're, we're appealing to these hardcore players and there was the skill trees did this and had some problems, so we solved it by getting rid of that. Mm -hmm. Well, you, but you now alienated all the players who didn't yeah. care whether they were on the optimum path they wanted to experiment, you know, and now they yeah. can't experiment until they get to level 20 when they can, and, yeah. you know, I'm not trying to just bash the game, I'm saying you make decisions. So yeah. in our game, we want to appeal to, yeah, min-maxers who are like, how can I make the perfect party? And also people who are thinking like, oh, this is so fun, like I made a party of four bards, and <laughs> we went down and like we yeah, all yeah. told tales, we were great in camping, but man, yeah. we got just obliterated in combat. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But it's a, it leads to an interesting, I guess, design um, thing, which I think is kind of cool in, about Darkest Dungeon in general is, one of the ways that I'm compensating for the fact that there's an enormous amount of systems and complexity in the game, uh, not necessarily complexity to the user, it's yeah, not going to be Crusader Kings or yeah. Dwarf Fortress <laughs> in terms of usability. Yeah. Um, by the way, both those are amazing games, yeah. uh, but we're not setting out to make that no. game. Um, yeah, not ASCII we, art. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. No, and and we want people to be able to get into the game and then realize there's all these other layers to it. Yeah. Um, but. Anyway, what I was, I guess, saying is one of the ways I'm compensating for the fact that there's an enormous amount of systems and mm -hmm. it's a small team is not everything is going to be balanced. Mm -hmm. So the way, and that's, that's purposeful, Yeah, is I think it's cool if some characters are flat out better than other characters. Mm -hmm. Not about every possible thing across the board, or yeah. some, some things are better than others. Like you, if you balance too much, you can create a situation where everything's bland. Like you're saying, yeah. like if you had a deck of all perfect cards, whatever, you know. Yeah. Yes, there's still decisions to make, but it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting when you got to figure that stuff out. And the meta goal of Darkest Dungeon, which um, we're going to be revealing that as well, kind of the whole reason you're doing this, you know, in Rogue, mm -hmm. it's descend to the bottom and break the staff or kill yeah. the wizard, or I forget, every Rogue like is a little different. Yeah. Um, so we have a meta goal as well that drives the overall um, progress of the game. And we're designing that in such a way that, you know, Let's say hypothetically, crusaders were just the best class. Period. Mm -hmm. End of story. Like, if you have four crusaders, you can tackle anything way easier than yeah, you know the hypothetically. Yeah, hypothetically. Yeah. Then um, we're designing the meta goal in such a way that okay, but you're you you're not going to be able to do everything with four crusaders. Right. You know, eventually, or maybe you will, but it's going to take you actually you longer. Choose than if you could find a way to get the you know the scared yeah. bard down there mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So there's some really fun stuff we're exploring there, but. And I think it'll make for interesting, um, you know, figuring out the ins and outs of the, of the classes and maybe people rushing to judgment and going, oh, this class sucks. And then mm -hmm. you realize, wow, if you pair this class with this class and this, and then maybe try to give him these quirks and develop this, you know, these, yeah. then he turns into this amazing thing. So yeah, yeah. Those, those are fun, um, fun things to explore, which, um, you know, if, if I had other, one other thing about game design just to say is I, I want to make games that I want to play. Yeah. And I guess everyone probably thinks that way, but part of the reason that it's not fully scripted, this goes back to that, is I want to be able to enjoy the game and kind of play it and mm -hmm. be surprised by it myself. So I'd rather yeah. design a system to make that happen mm -hmm. than create this amazing moment that I only, I never get to enjoy. It's like, Peter, can Peter Jackson really watch Lord of the Rings and enjoy it? Uh, I don't yeah. know. Like, he probably remembers all the hassle of that day yeah. of shooting. Or when and, he wanted that shot to be. Yeah, or, well, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and remembers there was a, you know, a truck here and the caterer was right here. And I'm yeah. probably any movie maker has that struggle. But ideally, I think one of the cool things about games is the creation process doesn't necessarily tarnish the ability to actually play enjoy it. Like, I've played Horde and enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. I haven't enjoyed all the games I've made, but, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, uh, well, I have. It's funny. Um, so... Yeah. Um, I was going to say an example, I think, of about as close to a perfectly balanced game as you can get is chess, mm -hmm. right? And I, I don't like chess. Mm -hmm. I admire chess mm -hmm. quite a bit, um, but but chess, like the the, the chess community, yeah. is is 
nigh on impenetrable. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's, a, there's a steep learning curve if you want to get to the real people that are like breaking the new ground, right? Yeah. Um, however, that brings me on to the topic of board games in general. Because I think for you in particular, there's a question about board games or video games, mm. right? How do you decide? One, one or A, whichever you mm -hmm. prefer, how do you decide for any particular concept? Mm -hmm. And how do you decide for your career? Yeah. You know, the unfortunate answer, um, I think it's unfortunate in a variety of different ways, is it's much easier to make a living in video games than board games. Now that doesn't mean I don't love video games. I mean, I've, I've played so many games in my life and I've equally been split. Like I was raised playing board games. I was raised on the earliest video games ever. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to play Space Invaders in the arcade. I had Pong, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I also have been playing board games since, you know, my whole life and I've managed to keep doing both. So I really love them both. Um, it's really hard to make a good living in board games. Mm -hmm. And so that, unfortunately, at this stage in my life has, it colors a lot of the way I think about things. Um, I mean, Crows, you know, Crows is an example. Definitely not a well-known game, not a hit by any means. You know, I'm proud of the game, it's decent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it didn't earn anywhere close to even sustaining me for a fraction of a year, practically. Um, now, it could have, you know, like, I mean, if you get settlers, that's amazing. Yeah. But the point is, like, both industries are hit-driven, but it tends to be a little bit easier to make a living wage in video games. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is my living, it's not a hobby. Um, mm -hmm. I can do whatever I want in my hobby time, for example, work on whatever personal, you know, game projects. But I have to, unfortunately, you know, I'm not in a position where, mm -hmm. um, Let's say I had one big hit game, you know, or a huge hit game, and now I don't have to worry about money the rest of my life. I would, I would approach all these projects, uh, not all of them, I, I would approach my, my life and my game design uh, maybe differently because I could say, oh, you know, I've been really wanting to do that board game more than I wanted to do this next video game for a while. Mm. And I would do it, you know. Uh, whereas right now I kind of have a responsibility to, you know, myself to say, well, I'd like to eat, you know, and um, now fortunately Darkest Dungeon is awesome because it's both the game I most want to do yeah. and, you know, it's a video game which gives a chance of earning a respectable wage. Sure. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, economics unfortunately factors into it. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also almost 40, so, you know, the, it's, I have to think about those things a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and. You know, I have taken some swings at, at, at both sides, and you know, I did some early board game stuff, and you know, I, I've I've learned the economics of the industry a bit, and uh, you know, you kind of have to get more games published. Like, I'm really I'm a bit player in board games, right? I mean, it, the experience is great for for uh, video games, but I have a lot more I need to do on the board game side to be, you know, a serious yeah. uh, member of the board game design community, for example. Um, and the way you do it is you start getting a lot of games published and the nice thing about games is they, uh, board games, some of those have a longer tail than video games. And so, you know, if you've, if you've done 20 designs over the last five years or 10 years, well, each of those are kind of selling a little bit and then you can make a living on the kind of aggregate. Um, but, you know, video games, you can, you can take a job at a studio if you need to or, you know, we're doing the indie route and there's still a chance to make a good living there. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, that factors in. You know, it's not try to be depressing about it, but opportunity cost is a big thing for me now. I have mm -hmm. to think about um, what's, you know, how much time it makes it takes to make a good game, and is that going to pay, going to pay mm -hmm. off in any way? My goal is not just the money side. No. But I do want to, you know, I think the perfect, you know, the perfect scenario is you make a, a great game, and it's also, um, you know, commercially uh, viable and sustains you, so... You know, I have to kind of look at those things a little bit. And then, of course, personal projects, sometimes it's fun to just do something that, who cares about the commercial viability? And I have mm -hmm. all those things going on too. Yeah, those yeah. are really satisfying and fun to do. And um, I think a really important part of the creative process, so, hmm. yeah. So then. Which, I don't know, yeah, I, I hate even saying that, but it's it's the truth, you know, you kind of, um, fortunately there's, there's a lot of cool things going on now with crowdsourcing Kickstarter, but even if you take like a big board game success, you go, well, you know, that game made, 700,000 on Kickstarter, like Zombicide. Well, yeah, they got a manufacturer, they got a, so when all that's said and done and they shipped, 
you know, um, it's not like the team's getting rich necessarily. Now, mm -hmm. if they can then do another game and build a business out of it, that's awesome, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And that's what you, you kind of got to do. I think any, any game endeavor, short of having a major hit out the gate, you know, you kind of have to build the value over time and keep hoping for a home run.